have a basic understanding of the strong force and the electromagnetic force, it's time to discuss the weak interaction. Now the weak interaction in the standard model is sort of the, the bad boy of the standard model interactions. And that's because if there's a rule to be broken, a symmetry to be violated, it's the weak force that does that. And the weak force is mediated by these massive W and Z bosons. And those interactions with the W and Z bosons, as you can imagine, introduce quite a few new uh, Feynman diagram vertices. So let's start by having a look at those. So here we have the simplest Feynman diagram, essentially the, the, the vertices associated with the fermions and the W and Z bosons. So over here we have what are called the neutral current interactions and that's because of course the Z here has no charge. Sometimes it's even written as Z0. So the Z boson will couple to electrons or muons or tau's, right? So it will couple to the charged leptons, so this could be a muon or a tau as well. And it will also couple to the quarks, right? And this could be any type of quark, so down, charm, top, whatever you want. Uh, all six flavors of quarks can come in here. The important thing to note is that the Z does not change flavor. So electron coming in, electron going out. If it's a muon, a muon comes in, a muon goes out. Similarly for the quarks. If you've got an up quark coming in, an up quark goes out. Now, <clears throat> this is in fact very similar to the photon, uh, which also couples to the charged leptons, and of course it couples to the quarks because they have charges. But the Z also has a vertex that the photon does not, and that is it will couple to the three types of neutrino. And so a Z here will couple to electron neutrino coming in, electron neutrino going out, so this could be Z decaying to an electron neutrino, an anti-electron neutrino, or it could be uh, an electron neutrino scattering through exchange of a Z, perhaps with a, a nucleus over here. But this interaction does not exist for photons because the neutrinos have no electric charge, so the photon cannot couple to them. The Z boson can. And in fact, this is why neutrinos are so weakly interacting, because of course this uh, term here, the mass of the Z is of order 90 uh, GeV over C squared, and whereas a photon is massless, and the huge mass of the Z is why neutrinos hardly ever interact, because they cannot interact through electromagnetism, they cannot interact through the strong force, they can only interact through the weak force, and either through a W or a Z, and this is means that they interact very, very weakly, and that's why they can pass through the planet at low energies, or they need light years thicknesses of materials at low energies in order to have an appreciable chance of, of stopping one. So those are the neutral current. The charged current here involve the W boson, which has an electric charge. Now, often you'll see it written in a diagram with a W. The reason for that is because, as we discussed, Feynman diagrams are somewhat ambiguous as to the direction of time. So by you know convention, we have time going this way, and using this convention, this will be a W minus, and this will be a W plus. But often they'll be just written with a W because that way you, you know, you're not specifying whether it's a W plus or minus because whether it's a plus or minus depends on if time was, uh, uh, sometimes depends on the uh, direction of time. So <clears throat> if we look at this, we have the W will couple a charged uh, lepton. So again, this could be a muon or a tau and it will couple it to the equivalent flavor of neutrino. Right, so again, an electron will be coupled to an electron neutrino, a muon will be coupled to a muon neutrino, a tau to a tau neutrino. And then this is potentially the most interesting vertex, because this couples quarks. <clears throat> but you can see here that we have an up quark coupling to a down quark. And that, of course, is because the W has a charge, so it can't couple an up quark to an up quark, because 
then you know you'd violate electric charge at this vertex here and that's forbidden so the only way a w can connect to quarks is if it changes an up uh, to a down or vice versa and so that means that the w is the only interaction in the standard model that can change the flavor of a quark so the other types of vertices that we get with weak interactions are the boson vertices and this is where the WZ and photon all couple together. So there are two vertices that involve three bosons, and these are the two here. And this involves two W bosons coupling to a photon or to a Z, and these will have opposite charges. So if this is W+, plus, this will be W-, minus. this is W+, plus, this is W-, minus. again, this is to conserve charge at this vertex because the photon and the Z, of course, are both neutral particles. And the photon is involved here because the W bosons have electric charge, so the photon can couple to them. There are also a series of four boson vertices. And so here we have, again, two Ws, and these would have opposite charges, now coupling to two photons. And we have the same thing here, where we have two W bosons coupling, again, with opposite charges to two Zs. And since we're using here the uh, photon and the Z seemingly interchangeable, there's also this one where we have two W bosons coupling to both a photon and a Z. And so these three vertices are all possible. Um, again, the photon is involved because the W has an electric charge. Now, the last one is essentially just four W bosons uh, interacting at a point. And again, um, these will have to have an equal balance of charges in order to conserve charge here at the vertex. So this is essentially a four W boson vertex. Now, as you've seen here, we've actually had Zs and uh, photons being used almost interchangeably. So what does that mean when it comes to looking at interactions? So here we have an uh, example of two sort of types of interactions. So this is uh, E plus, E minus going to mu plus, mu minus that we've seen many times before. And what we've got written here is Z slash gamma. And what that means is, is that this line here in the center, this propagator, it could be a Z boson or it could be a photon. Either one is possible. Now, which one is most likely will depend on the energy of the electron-positron pair. If, for example, you're at something like the Large Electron-Positron Collider, which operated for many years at about a 90 GeV center of mass, which happens to be equal to the Z boson's mass, then it is almost certainly that most of the interactions will involve a Z. However, if you're a long way above that, uh, well, a long way below that in energy, then it's almost certain, entirely certain, that you're almost going to have nothing but photons. And so you can see that, you know, both of these particles, both the Z and the photon, can be used interchangeably in this sort of diagram. However, if one of your vertices, like this one here, involves uh, two neutrinos, then the only particle you can have is the Z because the photon cannot couple to neutral particles. So <clears throat> in most cases where you haven't got two neutrinos, and again, this is a pretty rare interaction. Um, so in most cases where you haven't got two neutrinos, you can have a mixture of either a Z boson or a photon, and that largely depends on the energy of your interaction. So as we can already see, even from the simple Feynman diagram vertices, the weak interaction is already breaking the rules. We have the charged interaction vertex with the W boson that can change the flavor of a quark. And this is the only interaction in the standard model that can change quark flavors. Now it's important to note that it's only the, new, it's only the charged interaction that can do this. It's only the W boson that can change quark flavors. The neutral interaction, the Z boson, 
cannot change the flavour of a quark. In that regard, the Z boson is in many ways similar to the electromagnetic photon, the difference being, of course, that the Z can couple to neutral neutrinos. So it can couple to neutrinos, which, of course, the photon cannot do because they don't have an electric charge. So <clears throat> we can see from this that the weak interaction is already starting to look quite interesting. However, the weak interaction can do more than just couple quarks within a generation, so coupling up to down, charm to strange, and top to bottom. It can actually couple quarks between generations. And so let's have a look in a bit more detail about how the weak interaction manages that. Now, the way the weak interaction can mix generations of quarks is because the strong flavor eigenstates are mixed when it comes to the weak eigenstates. Essentially, the weak eigenstates are a mixture of the strong eigenstates. And we can describe this using this matrix here, which is known as the CKM matrix. And this is Kabibo, the C stands for Kabibo. He was, in fact, the first uh, physicist who came up with this. He came up with it when we only had um, two generations. So we only had the, uh, the, the up, down, charm, and strange. And so he actually had a two by two matrix. So essentially these four components here, and that was the Kabibo uh, matrix. And then Kobayashi and Maskawa uh, came along later and extended his model to three generations. Um, and remarkably, uh, as many people thought this was uh, a rather a bit of a steal because Kobayashi and Maskawa got the uh, Nobel Prize uh, a few years ago for, for their contributions. And Kabibo, who was still alive at the time, got absolutely nothing, even though he was the person who originally came up with the idea for a two-generation mixing. Now, uh, the way it works is that here we have the strong uh, flavor states, right? Um, and so these are the, you know, down, strange, and bottom quarks, or up, charm, top quarks. And, and these are the flavor eigenstates. These are the uh, weak eigenstates. And so the CKM matrix describes the mixing of the strong flavor eigenstates that are necessary to make the weak flavor eigenstates. So VUD, VUS, and VUB essentially give you the components of the down, strange, and bottom that make up the down prime, if you like, weak eigenstate. Similarly for the strange and the bottom eigenstates are mixtures of down strange and bottom strong flavor states. And so this mixing allows a, a vertex something like this. So we can have a, a quark line coming in to a W boson, and then this can be a charm here, and it can couple to a down, because the charm um, weak flavor state is a mixture of, you know, all three strong flavor states. So how does this work? Well, if we uh, get a better understanding of it, we need to actually look at some numbers here. So what I'm going to do is if you look at the uh, matrix underneath, you can see the approximate numbers um, that uh, correspond to these um, VUD, uh, VUS, and so on. And as you can see, there is a clear um, diagonal terms here, so the terms along the diagonal that are highlighted have values that are very close to one, right? So these terms here have values, particularly for the uh, third generation, that are very close to one. And what that means is that this type of diagram is suppressed, right? Where you couple between generations, it is less likely to happen than it would be, for example, for a charm to couple to a strange. So the quarks prefer to couple within their generation, but they can couple to other generations. And so vertices like this with a charm and a down are perfectly allowed, or you know, we could have a strange and an up. Both of these are perfectly fine. Um, but 
you know, strange and charm will tend to couple together, up and down will tend to want to couple together, and particularly for, for T and, and B here, they really want to couple within their generation. And so one side effect of this, for example, is that the top quark almost always decays into a bottom quark. It almost never decays into anything else other than a B quark. Um, because this generation is so coupled, you know, is, is so coupled within itself, very, very weakly connected to others. Um, but that's also one of the reasons why B mesons, which can only decay by going to one of the lighter generations, that's why B mesons have such long lifetimes, because they're suppressed by this, what's called Kabibo suppression. Now, the other thing to note is that within the first two generations, there is quite a bit more mixing going on. And in fact, if you look at this sort of two by two matrix here, so the CKM matrix is a three by three unitary matrix. But if you look at this two by two matrix here, uh, this is what Kabibo came up with. And you can represent this as sort of essentially a mixing angle when you've only got one, when you've only got two generations. And so there is a what's called the Kabibo angle, which is roughly about 13 degrees. And that shows that while there is a small mixing between the first two generations, it is, you know, it is measurable, it's appreciable. Now, with a 3 by 3 matrix, one of the interesting things with a 3 by 3 matrix is that, <clears throat> so a 3 by 3 unitary matrix has three uh, angles or three phases, if you, uh, three angles essentially, right? So whereas the Kabibo one only had one angle, for a 3 by 3 matrix we have three angles, but we also have one complex phase. And that complex phase, as we'll see in a few videos' time, turns out to be extremely important, or at least extremely interesting. Um, and so going to th a 3 by 3 matrix, in fact, this complex phase is possibly the only reason we may have for why we need three generations of quark instead of just two generations of quark. Um, and so, you know, that's one of the mysteries in the standard model. Why are there three generations of quarks? Why are there three generations of leptons? Well, the fact that you get this complex phase and you only get it when you go to this three by three mixing matrix turns out to maybe at least be a clue as to why we need a three, uh, at least three generations. If you have four, you just have more of these complex phases, but you don't gain anything new or exciting, right? So three generations is the minimum that gives you this complex phase. And that turns out to have some very interesting properties. Anyway, I think that's a thorough uh, overview of quark mixing. So now that we've got an understanding of this CKM matrix and how quarks uh, mix when it comes to the weak interaction, how the weak eigenstate is a mixture of the strong eigenstates, we've now got a way to rank the likelihood of decays. Now, of course, the most important thing when trying to rank the likelihood of decays is the type of interaction. We know that the strong interaction is a lot stronger than electromagnetism, and so those sorts of decays are likely to happen, uh, are most likely to happen because of the, the strong nature of the interaction, the high coupling constant that the strong force has. Those are followed by electromagnetic decays, and then, of course, we have the weak interactions, which are the least likely to occur. However, if the weak interaction is the only thing that can occur, then, of course, that's what will happen. So we've got this ranking strong, electromagnetic, and weak. But within the weak interaction, we can also start to rank the decays or interactions. If we have a uh, W boson and we have a mixing, the interaction requires a mixing between generations, then that decay or interaction is said to be Kabibo suppressed. So for example, if you have a charm quark coupling with a down quark um, at one of the W vertices, then that, that interaction is Kabibo suppressed because if you look at the off diagonal elements of the CKM matrix, you can see that there are a lot smaller quarks prefer to uh, interact or decay, as it were, couple to quarks of their own generation. However, you know, they do couple to quarks of other generations. And sometimes, particularly, for example, in meson and baryon decays, 
That may be the only kinematically allowed decay because coupling within their generation may produce a heavier baryon or heavier meson. And so, you know, it has to decay to a lower generation. And that typically gives those uh, mesons and baryons longer lifetimes. That is, in fact, the reason why the strange mesons that were discovered back in 1947 had such long lifetimes, because the only way they could decay was a strange coupling with an up quark. So, if you have that happen at one vertex, this intergenerational uh, quark coupling, then it's Kabibo suppressed. If it happens at the other vertex as well, which sometimes is required for certain decay modes, then you can have a decay that is doubly Kabibo suppressed and even less likely to happen. And so we can now come up with a ranking of our decays where we have strong, electromagnetic, weak, and then within weak we can have non-suppressed, Kabibo suppressed, or doubly Kabibo suppressed. There are other rules that can sometimes go govern decays. There's a rule associated actually with the strong interaction called the OZI or Aussie rule. Um, and that states that if you can cut your diagram in two by only breaking gluon lines, then that decay mode is suppressed compared to other strong decay modes. So there are additional rules. Now, if we go back and look at our uh, Feynman diagram vertices again, one of the things that you will remember is that when we were looking at the boson vertices, we weren't just coupling W and Z bosons together, we were also coupling photons in there. And there is a very fundamental reason for that, and that is that the weak interaction is not an independent interaction compared to the electromagnetism. There is a single electroweak interaction. In other words, the weak interaction and the electromagnetic interaction are two aspects of the same force. Now this is something you're already familiar with. You're familiar with electric fields and magnetic fields, but thanks to Maxwell, you regard these as two aspects of a single electromagnetic force. Well, the electroweak force is exactly like that. The W and Z and photon are all essentially mixtures of four fundamental fields that give rise to the four bosons. Obviously, the electromagnetic force with the photon looks quite a lot different to the weak force, but the main reason for that is the massive, huge mass of the W and Z bosons. And in fact, that's what makes the weak force weak. The huge mass of the W and the Z mean that at low energies, these interactions are hugely suppressed simply by the mass of the W and Z bosons compared to the photon, which of course is massless. In fact, the coupling of the electromagnetic force is, is, is actually you know, weaker than the coupling for the weak force. It's the mass of the bosons that make it appear so weak in typical interactions, unless you go to very, very high energies. Now, having unified the weak and electromagnetic forces, you might then think, well, hang on a minute, what about unifying the strong force? And in fact, efforts have been made in that regard. As we know, the strength of the forces vary with energy, and the weak force is actually like the strong force, and it gets weaker as energy increases. And so that means we've got two forces getting weaker, one force getting stronger, and so they're going to cross. We've got three lines, uh, and they're going to intersect. But as you might expect, um, when those three lines they don't intersect at a point, they just looks like three random lines. As you can see, they, they don't come together at a single point. However, if something called supersymmetry exists, and supersymmetry is a symmetry between fermions and bosons, you can sort of think of it as simply as a symmetry between force and matter. And if that symmetry exists, then miraculously, the three lines converge at a single point. 
Now there is absolutely no evidence yet that supersymmetry is a real symmetry of nature. There's lots of reasons to think that it might be, although more recently there's a good reason to think that it might not because no sign of it has been seen at the Large Hadron Collider, which means if it is, uh, if it does exist, it's at a far higher energy than we thought it might be. Now, when you look at that, you can say, well, okay, if those forces all converge there, maybe there's some grand unified theory, as they're called, where all the forces come together. And indeed, you can construct such theories. They come with fractionally charged X and Y bosons, and a startling consequence of that is that you can now have things like the proton decay. Now, proton decay obviously is not something we have observed, and people have actually done in you know gone to great lengths to try and, and limit, you know, put a limit on the, the lifetime of a proton or observe its decays. And I think the lifetime now for the proton is in excess of 10 to the 40 years. It's, I mean, it's way, way up there. And they do these experiments by looking at massive numbers of protons and searching for signs of a proton decaying. Now, the reason that we can still have these grand unified theories is because, of course, they occur at a scale of about 10 to the 16 GeV. And as I said, the weak forces suppressed by the large mass of the W and the Z bosons, well, you can imagine that if you've got X and Y bosons up at 10 to the 16 GeV, they're even more suppressed to the point where the proton could potentially live um, you know, far longer than our limits. Although the simpler models of grand unified theories have now been ruled out because they would have a proton decay too fast um, and that would have been observed by experiment. So the simple models of grand unified theories are ruled out, but it's still sort of one of the things that particle physicists or at least particle theorists think about that maybe there is some fundamental unification between the strong and the electroweak force at some enormously high energy scale. But if there is, so far we've not seen any signs of it. Now at this point we've covered almost all the standard model interactions. There's one interaction left and that is the Higgs boson. However, the Higgs boson couples to mass. So it couples to any particle that has a mass and that means that it doesn't actually add any interactions that aren't already allowed by the other three types of interactions, strong, weak, and electromagnetic. So, the, and in fact, if there, if there were any interactions that required the Higgs boson, it would have made it very easy to, in fact, infer its existence, and we'd have found it a long time before you know, uh, 2012. So the fact that the Higgs doesn't add any new interactions or new possibilities for interaction, coupled with the fact that because of the extreme mass of the Higgs boson, 125 GeV, um, which suppresses Higgs interactions enormously, it means that Higgs interactions are not really important at all in factoring out you know, how things decay or typical interactions unless you're going to very, very high energies. So for the time being, we're going to put the Higgs on one side. We will come back to it. We will go through the full Higgs mechanism and show how it gives the W and Z and all the other particles mass. And we will discuss the Feynman diagrams for the Higgs. But for the moment, just to keep things simple, we're going to set that on one side. So now we have an almost full picture of all the standard model interactions. And one of the things that we can note from all of these Feynman diagram interactions is the certain symmetries, certain conservation laws. For example, we know that electric charge and color charge are both conserved. There's no vertex which breaks uh, electric charge conservation or color charge conservation. So those are conserved. Similarly, we know that baryon number is conserved. And we know that simply because quarks are conserved. We can annihilate a quark with an antiquark, um, or we can create a quark and an antiquark together, but we can't just destroy a quark with you know, no consequence. So that means it's a consequence of that, that there's no vertex that allows us to do that, um, unless you go to these extremely high energies and introduce these, these weird and wonderful gut theories. Um, because there's no vertex that does that, uh, we know that baryon number is conserved, although 
One of the motivations for these gut theories is that we know at some point baryon number almost certainly is not conserved because our universe is full of baryons and there's no anti-baryons anywhere. So something way back at the time of the Big Bang did violate baryon number, but what that is, we simply do not know at this point. The other conservation law we have is lepton number, right? The absolute number of leptons is always conserved, just like we have for quarks. We can create a lepton and an anti-lepton together, but we can't just create a lepton by itself or destroy a lepton by itself. So lepton number is also a conserved quantity. Although thanks to neutrino oscillations, neutrino oscillations are the only mechanism we know that violates lepton flavor. So we used to think that the number of electrons was constant, the number of muons was constant. This is of course taking into account both the charged variety and the neutrino variety. Um, however, we know due to neutrino mixing that lepton flavor is not violated, but that is the only mechanism which violates lepton flavor. So if there's no neutrino mixing involved, then lepton flavor is also conserved. And since neutrino oscillations are sort of, you know, a tack on, as it were, beyond the standard model, which we'll deal with a lot later in the course, for the moment, lepton flavor you can generally regard as being conserved unless there is a neutrino oscillation involved. So, at this point, you know, we've got all these conservation laws, and that means there's some symmetries. And so it's time to start looking at the symmetries of the standard model. And in particular, there's a very interesting one related to flavor, a flavor symmetry between the up and the down quark, because the up and the down quark have almost identical masses. And so that's the symmetry we'll look at next time.